This video is sponsored by Brilliant. In last week's video, we took a look at how AI is one of the modern tools used to advance systemic racism, often unintentionally. If you haven't seen that video yet, I'll include a card up top as well as a link in the description. But in short, we discussed the ways that systemic racism has existed for long before AI did, as well as how AI can advance systemic racism in different ways than other tools have in the past primarily by amplifying biases in ways that are difficult for us to interrogate. Today we're going to focus on what will hopefully be the future AI systems with minimal bias. But how can we remove bias from AI systems? And what does it mean for an AI system to be fair in the first place? Well, there's a whole lot of research on both of those topics, so we're going to go through a bunch of it today. If you're new here, hi, I'm Jordan, and I'm a PhD student who's fascinated by the ways that we interact with algorithms and artificial intelligence on a daily basis. Consider subscribing if you'd like to keep learning with me, and let me know what other topics you'd like for me to cover in the comments down below. Before we get into fixing bias in AI, we should probably talk about what it means for an algorithm to be fair. After all, that's presumably our goal in reducing bias. However, fairness isn't particularly well defined in machine learning. Historically, the person developing the algorithm was also the person who got to decide what was fair, and focus was often placed on making sure that groups of equal merit were treated equally. However, the definition of merit has often been influenced by either personal biases or certain goals to the point where what seems fair to the developer may not actually be fair for the people that the algorithm is applied to. More recent work has focused on resolving inequities and redistributing power or trying to make the outcomes of the algorithm equal for everyone. However, some studies have shown that optimizing algorithms this way can lead to bad outcomes for everyone instead of improved outcomes for some people. In short, we don't really have a general benchmark for when an algorithm becomes fair, and creating a framework to define that is an ongoing area of research. In spite of that, there has been considerable research on how to make algorithms fairer, which usually focuses on ensuring equitable outcomes for every group while maintaining the performance of the algorithm overall. Let's walk through the pipeline of developing an AI algorithm to see how we can make these algorithms fairer at each step. Our first step before collecting the data or developing our model is defining our problem so that it avoids bias. As I mentioned in the last video, this might seem easy. You have a task that you would like for your model to complete, so that's your problem. However, the solution your model arrives at may answer a different question, perhaps because of the data you use, the model you've chosen, or how you've chosen to optimize your solution. In short, while you may be looking to answer a question that is easily understood by a human being, it's important to make sure that when you translate that question into language that a model can understand, you're still asking the same question. One example that we looked at last week was an algorithm used in clinical settings to recommend personalized treatment plans for high-risk patients. In all likelihood, the question that developers were trying to answer is which of these patients are sicker. Instead, the question that they ended up answering is which of these patients is most likely to spend money on healthcare. Now, the developers likely didn't realize this at the time, especially since healthcare spending was only one variable that they were using to predict patient risk. However, it did result in a drastically different outcome from the one intended. Part of formulating your problem also involves talking to both the people who plan to use the algorithm, as well as the people that the algorithm will be used on. This paper on understanding unintended consequences in machine learning provides a great example of this trade-off. For predictive policing algorithms, law enforcement, which would be the users of the algorithm, may want an algorithm that identifies any high-risk people, with the trade-off of misidentifying innocent people in the process. On the other hand, the communities that this algorithm might be used on might want an algorithm that doesn't misidentify innocent people at the expense of not catching all of the high-risk people. So let's assume that we formulated our problem statement to the best of our ability, and now it's time to collect some data. And this is where a lot of things can go wrong, but there's also a lot of opportunities to improve fairness. Let's start with the first decision. Do you want to use an existing data set, or do you want to collect your own? Collecting your own data is time-consuming and expensive, so most people will try to find an existing data set that suits their needs, or that can be altered to suit their needs. If you do end up collecting your own data set, there are a variety of biases that can be introduced into that, primarily under the umbrella of something called selection bias. And some of this bias might not be your fault. Studies conducted on college campuses often have this issue because college students aren't particularly representative of the general population, but researchers have plenty of access to college students and not a ton of access to other people. I'm not going to spend a ton of time focusing on selection bias when it comes to creating your own data set because a lot of those issues can end up being a bit specific to your problem, but if you'd like to read more about that, I'll include a citation to a paper that you might want to read up here. 
Okay, so let's say you start with an existing data set. One of the first issues you might run into is class imbalance. This means that the number of samples in each group that you're trying to study isn't representative of the number of samples that you'd normally find in the real world. As we've discussed, a lot of race and gender bias starts here. Women and people of color are often underrepresented in these data sets, resulting in inaccurate predictions when used on those populations. However, it extends far past race and gender. Another common one is geographic bias. A study from Google analyzed ImageNet and OpenNet, two large and commonly used image datasets, and found a clear bias towards images from the United States and Western Europe. Used in other countries, models trained on these datasets failed to identify objects common to those regions. So how do we fix this? Your first instinct is likely to collect more data, add more pictures of women and people of color, or images from China, or whatever you need to resolve the class imbalance problem. This instinct is a good one, but unfortunately it's almost never that easy. You may not have ready access to the resources needed to collect that data, whether it be financial resources or physical access to that location. Alternatively, that data might not exist. This is a challenge for things like medical data from clinical trials, which have historically focused on middle-aged white men. You can't redo the clinical trial. Some have approached this issue by, when possible, scraping data from the internet. This is particularly prevalent in image datasets. However, it's often done without permission from the people whose information you're collecting and potentially in violation of the terms of service of that platform. So that's not really a simple solution either. Another way to circumvent this issue is actually to reduce the size of your data set by removing data from categories that are overrepresented until your data set becomes representative. The issue that you may run into with this approach, however, is that you end up with a relatively small data set that your model learns too well, and then it doesn't work on the real life data anyway. This is called overfitting. In some cases, you can actually synthesize additional data to expand your data set. I did this on a project for machine learning in medical imaging, and we actually did this in an AI 101 video on how to create your first neural network a few months ago, where we initially trained a model to recognize clothes, and then flipped and rotated the images when we realized that it could only recognize pictures of images in one orientation. However, synthesizing data can come with its own caveats. At the end of the day, you're generating data from the same distribution as that old data set. So if that distribution doesn't represent real life, then that's not going to help you very much. So when it comes to data, the best way to reduce some of the bias in your model is to make sure that the distribution of your data represents the real world problem that you're trying to solve. There are a lot of statistical methods, including something called regularization that you can use in order to do this. And I'll include some resources in the description box, but I'm not gonna dive too deep into the statistics themselves. However, even if your data set is balanced, this may not reduce all of the bias in your model due to something that we'll talk about next, bias amplification. Okay, so you have your data and it may or may not be biased. You train your model, you check your outputs, and yikes, there's definitely some bias issues here. In fact, the bias may be worse than it was in the original data set. I mentioned this in the last video, but several studies have shown that neural networks tend to amplify existing biases in their data sets. In a study from 2017, researchers found that two common multitask classification image data sets were biased along gender lines alone, and that the model predictions were then even more biased than the data set was. For example, the data set was over 33% more likely to associate cooking with women than men, but the trained model was 68% more likely to do so. This is due to two phenomena called data leakage and model leakage. Data leakage is defined as the degree to which dataset labels can be used to estimate a protected class, in this case, gender. So in the cooking example, if you wanted to determine whether an image contained a woman, and all you had was the label as to whether the image contained someone cooking, data leakage is the percentage of images that can still be classified correctly by gender using some formula based on that label. Similarly, model leakage is the degree to which model predictions can be used to estimate gender or another protected class. Using the previous example, if you wanted to determine whether or not an image contained a woman and all you had was the model's predictions of whether or not an image contained cooking, model leakage is the percentage of image that can still be classified correctly by some formula using only that predicted label. Bias amplification is then the difference between model leakage and data leakage. If models didn't amplify bias, we would expect the model leakage and the data leakage to be the same. What we actually find in this study is that the model leakage is worse than the data leakage is, demonstrating bias amplification. In another similar study from 2019, researchers wanted to see if they could reduce bias amplification by balancing their data sets such that each label was applied to each gender the same number of times. Instead, they found that even when they balanced their data sets, 
the trained model showed just as much bias amplification as the model trained on the unbalanced data set. So how do we reduce bias amplification? One of the interesting solutions from that paper was to remove the parts of the images that the model associated with gender. You can see the results of this on a picture of me here, and can try it on your own images using the link in the description. As I mentioned earlier, there are also statistical methods and mathematical constraints that you can use, depending on your model, to alter the distribution that the model learns in order to reduce bias. Another approach to bias mitigation is external auditing. This actually happens after the model has been developed, trained on your collected data, and is ready to publish or has already been released to the public. Within academia, this ideally happens through the preprint and peer review systems, where scholars in the field and anyone else who wants to read the paper can look through and provide feedback or critiques on the paper itself. A great example of this when it comes to commercial AI is the gender shade study that we discussed in the previous video, where researchers tested Microsoft and IBM's facial recognition systems to see whether or not they had race or gender bias and published the results, causing a bit of a scandal. External audits don't always cause scandals, though. There are companies like the Algorithmic Justice League and others that offer external auditing services for companies interested in making sure their algorithms are as fair as possible, and for companies who want to know what bias issues they might have in their algorithms before they release them to the public. In fact, Dr. Deborah Raj and Dr. Joy Bulamwini, who were both involved in the original study, published a follow-up study analyzing the impact of gender shades on the accuracy of the commercial AI systems from the original study. They found that all of the companies that they had originally audited reduced the error rate of their algorithms on darker-skinned women significantly, as well as on darker-skinned men and lighter-skinned women. Some of these companies explicitly referenced the study when they published their updated models as well. So while it does require the model to be released publicly, potentially causing some harm before the audit is complete, external auditing of commercial AI systems where the company is publicly named can be an effective approach. Finally, one way to minimize bias in your model is to not make the model at all. This is often a controversial idea in the machine learning community as well as in the scientific community at large, because historically, science was conducted based on whether or not we could do something, not based on whether or not it was ethically responsible to do it. However, that wasn't always the right approach then, and it isn't always the right approach now. We've talked about dual-use algorithms, or algorithms that have both positive and harmful applications, and while I'm not saying that we should stop research on those algorithms, in fact, I think that we should continue research on those algorithms, I am saying that there comes a point when an algorithm will almost definitely be used for harmful or malicious applications, and has no real positive impact or positive contribution to the scientific field. For example, a few weeks ago, a scientific journal mentioned in a press release that they would be publishing a paper on using deep learning to predict how likely someone was to be a criminal based on their face. The authors claimed to be able to do this with up to 80% accuracy and no racial bias. Almost immediately, there was backlash against the publication of this article from the machine learning community, and it has since been retracted. I'd recommend reading the letter signed by more than 2,000 machine learning academics, including me, if you would like a detailed rebuttal to this article. But in short, this algorithm is highly unlikely to have any significant positive impact and very likely to have significant negative impacts. In fact, this title seems somewhat misleading because the most that they can claim is that they developed a deep learning model that can predict whether someone looks like a criminal, which shouldn't be actionable information unless someone has committed a crime. Now, I haven't personally seen the specific methods that they used to develop this algorithm, nor have I seen the results of this algorithm for this paper, and I never will because it's not going to be published. So maybe it's not as bad as it looks, but from their press release, this seems like a great example of an algorithm that probably shouldn't have been made in the first place. As I mentioned in the last video, this is really only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to issues and research on fairness and bias in artificial intelligence and algorithms, so I've included links to all of the papers that I referenced in this video, as well as some additional reading for those of you who are curious. In particular, if you're interested in getting a better understanding of the math and statistics behind dataset bias, the best topic to start with would be a course on statistics fundamentals, and the best place to start is Brilliant. As you all know, I'm a huge fan of Brilliant's courses because they help you master concepts by solving fun, challenging problems. In particular, they have a great stats course called Statistics Fundamentals that will teach you how to analyze a dataset, make predictions, and tell when a dataset might be biased. And once you finish the stats course, you can move on to their machine learning series so that you can develop some hopefully unbiased models yourself. To get started, go to brilliant.org Jordan and sign up for free. 
In fact, the first 200 people to go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. I've been really impressed by their courses. They teach you to think like an engineer, letting you make mistakes and then learn from them with detailed explanations. So please check them out. Otherwise, if you'd like to watch more videos like this, you can check out my playlist on algorithmic bias and you can subscribe to my channel and smash the like button for this video to let me know that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow my PhD life, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and otherwise I will see you guys next Friday. Bye!